And even if you were to demonstrate this, it wouldn't be enough to make the claim that lockdowns work in general. What you would have really shown is that in some corner, in some one percent of the world population, in some corner of Europe, something may have worked for a moment. Now, if you want to ask the more general question and the more important socially uh, speaking, it is whether the lockdowns that have been implemented everywhere have been implemented properly. And my answer to this is no, because, and we can do it on the basis of no comparison to Sweden at all. We is, can make this it is on just the basis tangential of there. This is not the topic of the, the question isn't whether lockdowns have been implemented properly. The question is whether, based on the available evidence, we can conclude that a lockdown decreases total mortality. Well, my, my, my statement is we cannot affirm that most lockdowns have decreased mortality. The lockdowns okay. that were implemented. So it's important to distinguish. I'm not saying lockdowns in theory. I'm saying the lockdowns that were implemented, I don't have solid evidence that they have decreased mortality. Because okay, so that also was only... not that also was not the debate proposition. So the debate proposition wasn't the lockdowns that the specific lockdowns that were implemented decreased total mortality. The question, the, the debate proposition was: Do lockdowns decrease total mortality? Well, if you want to know if wrapping yourself into a saran wrap will keep you from catching virus, I have no doubt that there's a certain thickness of saran wrap that will work. The problem is that it will also kill you. So I don't see how the question of the debate can be anything else than the lockdowns that were implemented. Since they were the only one we could implement, harsher or longer lockdowns would have been unsustainable and would have caused even more death, most likely, through other through friends other to friends. other systems oh. like depression, suicide, and stuff like this. But that's the all going to be assumed. That's all going to be assumed in the all-cause mortality, regardless. So. If we let's just start well, let's just start with the data set that we have that we do have because we only here's the thing we don't have a lot of countries that have not locked down. We have Sweden that didn't have a mandatory lockdown. I don't know any other countries, so that's why we're comparing Sweden to other Nordic well, countries. There are and several we're... states of the U.S. There are several states of the U.S. There was no, which state of the U.S. had a actual lockdown where they where they banned travel where they, um, I mean, you could you had cross state travel throughout. I mean. I'm not well, aware in of. In general, in the U.S., there are nine states that are recognized, and it includes South Dakota and a handful of others that are recognized as having very uh, soft lockdowns or no lockdowns at all. And the rest of the states have had relatively harsh lockdowns in terms of cutting out businesses, cutting out most public activities, cutting out concerts and stuff like this. Oh, that's fine. I mean, and we if we can adjust that for. Um, the covariates totally cool and we can go through that analysis i don't have that analysis here and i suspect you don't either but again there's a, look here's the problem the problem is going to just be recurring data look there have been st states that have locked down there have been states that haven't locked down there are a whole bunch of different covariates that are going to confound whether you can infer whether a lockdown works or not now the best way is to adjust for e either to include everything in the data set and have a robust way of adjusting for the covariates or if you don't have that analysis the second best thing is to just go for the states that are most similar in covariates or countries that are most similar in covariates and look between ones that did and did not lock down now i'm presenting to you an analysis between sweden and the countries that are most similar to sweden by any by the overwhelming metrics of the relevant covariates being uh, pre-existing conditions, whether it's COPD, whether it's cancer rates, whether it's heart disease, whether um, it's uh, life expectancy, wh whether it's life expectancy per GDP. Um, you can look at those things, and the summation of that is just Sweden is really most similar to the other Nordic countries. Yes, that decreases your population size. It decreases your data set. I don't see how that also explains why if you add up all the all-cause mortality of of all the Nordic countries other than Sweden put together per capita, you still don't touch the toes of Sweden's deaths per capita. Now, if you want to say more countries should be added, that's fine. Show me which other countries you think should be added, and we can go through the covariates. It's not a problem. Uh, I, I don't even know that countries need to be added to your analysis. I think that we can reach an answer even without a comparison to Sweden. And here's how we do. 
So you recognize that COVID has been uh, creating a wave of excess mortality that is bigger than what we have, at least in the last few years. In fact, there are some maniacs out there on social media that say that it's the, the virus of the century. So we have a virus that has induced a bigger wave than most of the things we've been confronted to, at least in the last five years in Europe. Now, we look at waves like the UK, a big wave, UK, England, I see a big wave of excess mortality. In fact, more, more intense than the one we see even in Sweden. But let's leave the comparison to Sweden aside. I see this big wave of excess mortality, and you, you are telling me that lockdowns have worked enormously, that perhaps they even may reduce the, the excess death by a factor of four to five fold what we got. So you're telling me that the worst virus we've ever seen in the last five years, not only was the worst virus, but it could have been five times worse if we didn't have lockdowns. How does that How work? Does that okay, so I that haven't said any of that, JF. So I, I haven't said that it's, the worst, that it's the worst virus, nor if I said it, it decreased by fivefold. All I said was that if you look at the data set I presented to you, you need an explanation for why there was a fivefold difference. I'm not saying all of that fivefold difference is due to the lockdown. Maybe there are some unadjusted ah. for covariates that I that haven't been accounted. But this is the best data we have. It seems what? it seems hard to believe. Hold on. It seems hard to believe that all of the fivefold difference or fourfold difference would be explained by factors other than the lockdown is all what I, is all I'm saying. That's a, so it could be if, if you adjust for un. Uh, adjusted confounders that it turns out, well, it's only doubled. That's fine. My position still goes through, and the debate proposition would still be won by me if that's the case. You yeah, would have to make the case that all of them. Because you've been uh, accusing me of not controlling for covariates. Now I will accuse you of not understanding enough the covariates that are still present within the Nordic populations to make your affirmation that even any of this fourfold difference is attributable causally to the lockdowns. The problem is these countries differ in other ways than those that you measure. Some of this include, among other things, genes. We are talking about genetically different countries and they may show a different response to the same virus. Now to that, you have to start quantifying the, diff the normal differences that exist within countries, what kind of variability do they induce on the excess mortality waves that have been observed in the last five years? And you see massive difference in the response, as we were discussing in the, the, the more private conversation before this uh, show, uh, we do see massive differences in the way certain countries in Europe respond to a wave of virus. We see them readily with the eye, with the naked eye on the graphs of 2018, 2017. Look at France, for example, in the Euro Momo graphs and maps, France 2017. A big wave. Wait, a one big at wave a time, one at a time, JF. Let's just go one, one, one time at a time. So you said one of the covariates that I've not adjusted for is genes. I don't see how I haven't adjusted that to the best of the factor by using the Nordic countries. Do you have another country that's more similar in genes in the genetic makeup to Sweden than the neighboring Nordic countries? No, but your your fallacy here is to think that because no such countries exist, then it cannot be the factor underlying the difference. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you that so look so no, it's not. So what no, I'm saying is that can I, I acknowledge because you 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 keep you keep stopping me when I'm about to. I, I'll stop you, if you, if you if you misrepresent if you misrepresent me. I'm gonna if you misrepresent me. Your I'm gonna reasoning you is fallacious. Your reasoning is fallacious. I don't think you can reproduce that reasoning. It relies so, on the false state, the false belief that because a better basis of comparison does not exist in the world, then my basis of comparison is good. That no, is the that, fallacy. Nope. Oh, okay, so that's not what I claimed. All I claimed is that it's the best we have. Now, if you want to say the best we have is still bad, that's fine. But that's I'd like to point. see you make... Yeah, yeah, but I'd like to see you make that case. Like, how do we, do, how do we adjudicate whether the best we have is bad versus the best we have is not bad? And then, well, e it, even it, if you no, can... No, 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 not then, because you stopped me for going to answer your freaking question. And so you're going to learn not to interrupt me, because I was about to answer exactly this question. 
So how so do we do this? How do we reach a conclusion that our Sweden Norway experiment isn't a good one? Well, we look at past variability and we look at the current variability observed and we determine is this outside of the bounds the bounds of what has existed in the last few years? Is it outside of the bounds of the expected to see a little rise, a little bump in Sweden and not to see little bumps in Norway or little bumps in a handful of other Nordic countries? The answer is absolutely. These countries have bumps that are not coordinated across the year. Of course, sometimes you'll see two countries having a similar bump. Let's compare, for example, Germany and France 2018. Similar little bump. So I guess that some respiratory virus showed up in 2018 during the winter and caused similar effects in both countries. But then you have massive differences between these countries. For example, in Denmark 2018, you do see the bump, but you don't see it in Estonia, you don't see it in Finland. Uh, in France in 2017, you see the bump, but you don't see it in Estonia, you don't see it in Finland. Now, all of these differences of bumps in the excess mortality that's associated to the winter period have been happening, all of it without lockdown measures being implemented in any of these countries. And so at the question, the variability that I observed between Sweden and the other Nordic countries in 2020, have I observed anything like this before? The answer is yes. And was it due to lockdowns? The answer is no. Okay, so I'm looking at all the excess mortality throughout the entire data set. And in that entire data set from 2015 to 2020, you literally have never observed. You, you can go through all of it. You have never observed the bump to the degree that you have and to the difference between Sweden and, and the other Nordic countries such as Finland, Norway, Denmark. You just haven't. This is the only time throughout that entire data set where you have had excess deaths to differential degree of Sweden and the other Nor uh, Nordic countries. You, yes, well, you've had well, some bumps before that. You can go through it. You've had it, but you've never so had it. So let yeah. me tell you about one bump. Look at France 2017. Why are we and looking compare at France? It, compare it to Estonia 2017. This is exactly the same difference that there is between Sweden and, um, and Norway, for example. It's a bump in France and no bump in Estonia. The same way you have a bump in Sweden, but no bump in Norway. Now, are you telling me that in 2017 in France, there was a failure to have a proper lockdown in, in comparison to Estonia? No, it could be a million and a half different reasons why, but I don't see, and we can look into that, but I don't, I don't see how that's relevant. Well, here's another one. France 2020, that might be more relevant. France 2020 bump, a big bump, coronavirus induced, most likely. Compared to Germany, no bump at all. Two countries. Yeah, there's probably a difference in, them. yeah, so there's probably a difference for which there, there was some explanation for which France has the bump and Germany doesn't. So what's the, so, but the so I don't see how that's relevant. Here's my takeaway from all these, from all this thinking. Bumps appearing in countries and not in others is a regular phenomenon. It happens even in worlds where there's no lockdown at all in any of the countries. And there's no reason to believe in a world where there are lockdowns in some countries that they are necessarily causally linked to lockdowns. So what is your case ultimately for the bump in Sweden being causally linked to the absence of a lockdown. Do you just assume that it's the case because you've controlled for other variables or do you have a stronger case for it? Yeah, so the difference, so the difference between what you've said and what I've said is that in the case of the Nordic countries, the other, yeah, it's as if you said the other variables, the majority of the other variables that you can control for are controlled for. Now you can have a more robust analysis if you want to have a multivariate adjustment, that's fine. There, um, there ha you can uh, do that. That's totally fine. But if you just look at France and compare it to Germany, there are so many different covariates between France and Germany that are not, I I'm sure, not comparable in the slightest to the covariates 
um, of the Nordic countries, the most relevant covariates being pre-existing conditions, which are most tightly among Nordic countries. And even in the Nordic countries, you would expect Sweden to be better and they're worse. Even So my point is not just that you're controlling for the covariates. It's that you're controlling for the covariates in a generous way that favors Sweden. And yet you see Sweden do worse. I don't see how that's anywhere comparable to um, to the country to comparing France to Germany. And even if it was, um, the, there's no difference in the lock. I don't see any difference in the lockdown, whether they lock down or not lock down. Presumably they both lock down. And so I don't know. So maybe there is some difference between there, but I don't, but, and you may be able to go about picking apart that difference. That's fine. I just don't see the relevance. Yes. There are some countries that bump and some don't. That's totally fine. But if you have a, like but if you have an adjustment, if you have a robust adjustment for covariates, except for one factor, and then you see a bump that has been different that for, throughout the entire data set you've never seen before between those countries, and not only have the covariates been adjusted for, the covariates have been adjusted for in a way that favors Sweden. Sweden actually has lower pre-existing conditions than the other Nordic countries. Um, and if, and Denmark has had more immigrants from China that would be in that year that would be expected to import and have a higher inoculation of the coronavirus, both in terms of raw numbers and per capita than Sweden does. All the factors are going in favor of Sweden, and yet Sweden does worse. Why? Well, why is a good question, and it would be interesting to know. Uh, my, I guess I can finish on at least this part of the debate because I don't have much to add to then say a summary of my position. What we have here is someone arguing a causal link because he has, he believes he has mastered enough of the other possible causal links. I think that he's forgetting a many things that would be needed and I'm ultimately not satisfied by the controls that have been made. I think that these controls are designed to justify a statistical cherry picking of just a subset of countries. Even if we were to demonstrate that in that subset of country lockdowns have worked, I wouldn't be satisfied that in general lockdowns work because essentially this virus has been spreading toward the entirety of the population that it can infect. I don't see any evidence that uh, at the end of it all, we won't have essentially a major part, the majority of the population having been infected by this virus. And in that sense, lockdowns didn't work. And that's the sense in which I say it. It's that everyone ultimately will be infected by this virus or will just be in the lucky 20 or 30 percent that doesn't get infected. And the immunological studies on their own, without comparisons, are sufficient to conclude this, that the, you will get the virus. Uh, as far as the cherry picking that we're talking about, you were asking what kind of causes could justify this that I haven't captured. Well, I said, what kind of causes? Genetic differences. And your answer is that these populations are as close to each other as possibly can be. And I say, that's not enough. They're still different. They are still different. And there are cultural differences, uh, some of which may be included in your measures, some of which may not, in the way people act, in the way people interact, and in the way people uh, relate to their home and how they live in their home, go see their family, invite other people in their home. But there are ultimately also genetic differences, which are, have been completely out of this conversation. And we know why. It's because we don't have much comparative analysis of genetic differences between Nordic countries and how they could underlie different immune response, uh, the, the response of the immune system. And so my answer to you is I'm not satisfied. And as far as I can see, when I look at the planet, lockdowns have, if anything, they have slowed down the spread of a virus, but the spread of a virus that couldn't possibly be kept from spreading to the entire population, maybe in a year or two from now, everyone will have been exposed to the risk. And so let's just live with this risk and let's also accept that death is a complex thing. Uh, I, I personally don't see the world as viruses killing us. 
I think we're just due to die at some point, and the virus is the the one that uh, that comes to accomplish the task that could have been accomplished by other bacteria or other events that could have ruined our bodies. Uh, let's not forget that when we die from a respiratory disease infection, uh, we we don't just die from the virus. We die from the fact that our body was unable really to handle this virus. Okay, so a couple things here. So first of all, um, with the bar that you're setting, I don't know how you could conclude that lockdowns prolong um, the spread that would just have happen anyway, because you can make the same argument that you made against me that there are a whole bunch of covariants that I didn't take into account. Um, I can make the same argument stronger to you that if you look at countries that lockdown versus didn't lock down in terms of their delayed spread of the second wave, there could be a million and a half different covariates that aren't taken into account, and maybe the lockdown doesn't just prevent it. I don't know how you could make that claim. That seems to be a bit of an inconsistency on your view. Um, well, secondly, it's more, it's more a thing that I'm open to rather than a thing that I affirm. So I guess that our difference on this point is that I'm open to the idea that some lockdowns somewhere in the world may have slowed the spread of the disease. But I will note that none of these lockdowns have made it to the point where we would develop a vaccine. None of these countries are really able to maintain a, an economic lockdown of the size that we're talking about uh, for two years, three years. And so it's inevitable. <laughs> even if the lockdowns worked, which I'm not sure, but OK, even if they worked, uh, we would still be exposed to the virus at some point in the future. Yeah, and that and that's totally fine. In fact, that I made the case. Um, it's it's just borne out in the data that it's better that it, it's, if your goal is to prevent deaths, whether they're artifact or whether they're they're real, the case fatality rates are just far lower in the second wave or the first wave. But regardless, I I just want to get to your epistemic standard here because it seems like your epistemic standard is even if we have the best amount of data, yes, I agree it could still be bad, but even if you're harping on cultural differences, genetic differences, even though the countries I'm selecting for are most similar, both in cultural, both in terms of culture and in terms of genetic. Yes, there can still be differences. But it seems that if you have this epistemic standard, JF, that there would be a lot of reductios on a view like this, because there are many observational points of data. There are many um, conclusions we draw for observational data where not all of the covariates are controlled for that we seem to accept. We, for example, we accept that smoking uh, causes heart disease. We, ex even though there's no randomized control trial for it, it's all based on observational data, and not all of the covariates are controlled for. Um, we accept that uh, it, smoking causes lung cancer, even though all the same things apply. There are many things that are based on observational data that we accept, even though all the same arguments you're making against me can be made against someone who accepts a position like that. And so There's I'm just wanting to know. Difference with okay, the what's the difference? Case. The cigarette mm -hmm. disease the were not limited to a single country in the world constituted our basis for non-smokers <laughs> or for smokers. Like if, to, if tomorrow morning Sweden was the only country where people smoke, I would have severe doubts about cancer research related to smoking. It's the fact that uh, smoking is so spread and kind of stochastically spread across the planet that gives us much more of a basis of comparison. Okay, so just to be clear, so first of all, that wasn't the criticisms that you made against me firstly. Now you're adding a different criticism. You're saying, you, and which is fine, you can add a different criticism, but the criticisms I heard before were covariates. It wasn't just that there was only one country. Now, if you want to say there's only one country that has locked down, and that's my basis, that's my standard for um, not being able to make any, re any reliable inference, um, that's fine. Then that, that'll just come into a position where, you know, even if I agree that with you that it's, it's less robust than if multiple countries have locked down, it seems, it seems that we could still agree that the best available evidence is that lockdowns do reduce mortality. Can we agree on that? Even if the data is is even if it's questionable how reliable the data is, that's a separate question than than where the most reliable data, what direction that data indicates. So, if no, you want to take a position, no, because saying that, I, okay. I will not accept the best part because I cannot say best if the data does not meet a minimum standard. Uh, let are you are you a doctor? Yes. Let me ask you this: if a pill 
had the exact same support for it as the lockdowns do using your Swedish versus other country case. Do you think the FDA would approve the pill based solely on this evidence? No, I don't. All right. Well, th there but you I go. Think that, That's our difference. Yeah, but, but um, <laughs> no, that doesn't mean. Wait, 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 yeah, wait. Yeah. That doesn't mean. No, <laughs> look, that doesn't yeah, mean I'm, that. I'm essentially I'm epistemologically connected to the FDA. No, wait, 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 wait. I'm wait, a wait, wait. FDA second, standard wait. applier. Isn't that funny? <laughs> No, because JF, okay, so when we, the, the standards for FDA drug approval are completely different. It's, it's also not, it's not just a question of epistemology. It's a question of, there are other questions other than epistem epistemology that goes into FDA approval. It's a question of whether uh, the unknown risks outweigh the harms and et cetera. And you can make the same thing for lockdowns. But the, the point here is that that's just irrelevant to the question of, does the best, like there could be a pill that has the best available evidence for it and it indicates that it works and the FDA still doesn't approve it. That's fine. But if I just ask the question, the fact that it doesn't meet a bar from the FDA doesn't mean it can't be the best available evidence that it directs. So if you have a pill where the best available evidence indicates that it works, the FDA might still not approve it. They can say, okay, my bar is set here for approval, but it's still true that the best available evidence indicates that the pill works. And so if, uh, my, my question is, are you just taking a position where, you know, it just doesn't meet a bar for approval that we should do it, but e the, even if, if it is the case that the best available evidence indicates that it works, you can have a pill that doesn't meet approval and the best available evidence indicates that it works. I mean, you don't, uh, well, you don't disagree uh, with that. My position is not limited to morality in that sense. I will We're not talking about the morality. FDA. The the hypothesis, uh, the hypothetical FDA officials who would be faced with this lack of meeting of a standard of demonstration, they would go around not saying we don't approve this drug. They would go around saying there is no solid evidence that this drug works. The same way they did when talking about, say, uh, hydroxychloroquine in the media, at least, uh, the leftist media. So... Uh, there is here a, an epistemic question, and it's whether you will accept evidence that is loose to say, well, it's still the best evidence. I tend rather to just exclude these fields as existent at all. And so that's why you, you, were, you were concerned with my, with potentially the fact that I may not believe a lot of things. You're right, I don't believe in a lot of things. I actually reject the entirety of social studies and all of the crap of that kind, of surveys, of uh, population studies of many kinds. Uh, yeah, I do have a higher standard for knowledge, and I apply it today. So let me ask you this question real quick. So if Sweden were the only country that smoked, okay, and the neighboring countries of Sweden, um, so the other Nordic countries, so Denmark, um, uh, Finland, Iceland, um, if Norway, if they, if they did not smoke and you saw a four to five times greater incidence in lung cancer in Sweden from the other countries, you would say that it is not the case that the best available evidence indicates that smoking, uh, causes lung cancer. Now, notice that's not the same question as saying we have sufficient evidence to conclude that smoking causes lung cancer. The question I'm asking you is, does the best available evidence, assuming no other evidence on the table, does the best available evidence indicate that smoking causes lung cancer? Would you say yes or well, no to that? It is usually not in my practice that I talk of best available evidence. Uh, but yeah, I probably wouldn't say it. And I would probably say Maybe it's the wangum back cheese that they eat in Sweden that gives this cancer. Maybe it's their adelust. Maybe it's their vaster button burst track. I don't know what, what would be the conclusion, but I would certainly point out to the fact that we do not have sufficient evidence to conclude anything about lung cancer in, lung cancer in that situation. Okay, so... I, I mean, look, so it, 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 I, again, it's not the question I'm asking. So I'm not asking if we have sufficient evidence. So the question is, does the best available evidence? So I think, I think what you're trying to, I think your view on my position here is that, that 
you know, it's like a light switch where I, I either accept it and accept the conclusion or I reject and reject the conclusion. There's more, it's more of a continuum. It's more of a dial where it's like, it gives me, there's certain data that gives me uh, leaning toward one side or another. And it's sort of a, it, it moves the needle and it may move the needle a little bit. It may move the needle a lot. All I'm making, trying to make the case for is that the direction that the needle should move is in the direction that lockdowns prevent mortality. Now, there, I'm not... Thing, there, go ahead, sorry. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so all I'm saying is that if, yes, you, you can make a statement about the best available evidence, even if you don't consider the evidence to be above your bar for just taking a firm stance on a position. I'm, that's not the question I'm asking. I'm not asking you to take a firm stance on a position. I'm just asking if there's any leaning at all one way or, or another, is if it's exactly 50-50 for you. Uh, there's none, and there's there's a fundamental problem with what you're trying to have me do. Imagine I, I try to take you and say, I want to have you admit that human shit is the best form possible of food in a sewer. And and then I start making the case, look, the crickets are filled with disease, the dead birds' bodies are extremely toxic to your stomach. Human shit is really the best food you can find in a sewer. And we would all agree that human shit should not be eaten, that it's dangerous for you. But I would be trying essentially to make an invalid point, which is that human shit is food at all. It's not. And data that you're talking about is not data because it's because of the features that i've pointed out cherry picking selection ignorance of the greater data set and it leads to deception to self-deception in evaluating an effect so your position is that country-based data comparisons um and adjusting for covariates on country levels are just not even data at all that's your view Depends on the data set. Depends on the data set because you were making the distinction between two of my views and they really are one view. You see them as two, but they are one. You said that, oh, earlier you were making the case about the lack of covariate controls and now you're making the case about uh, Sweden being just N equals one. The fact that Sweden is N equals one causes problems in interpreting this data and in making these comparisons properly. It leads to the problem of undersampling, it leads to the problem of ignoring too much data, and it leads to eventually the problem that it, since you have ignored so much data, you now have covariates problem that emerge that are specific to this sub data set. All of these are scientific problems. All of these would be basis for rejection of a scientific article if you were to run such a study uh, in a proper journal. And so to me, they don't meet the, the definition of evidence at all. So I won't discuss that they are the best evidence. They are not evidence because they've been subject to selection that is not scientific in nature. I just don't see how any of these limitations, so what you're discussing are limitations, they're not invalidations. So yes, you can always have a limitation that there are covariates that are unadjusted for. Um, you could always have limitations of a data set. Um, I just don't see how they're full of invalidations. Um, I, I just don't get it. Um, now, if you, you can have that view if you want, that's totally mm -hmm. fine. Um, we can, uh, but you know, if you were going to really say that there's no reason at all for you to believe that smoking causes lung cancer if Sweden were the smokers of the world and all the neighboring countries, all the countries that were most closest in resemblance to Sweden did not develop lung cancer, uh, and Sweden did, if you want to take the position that you have literally zero reason to believe smoking is causal to lung cancer, not to say that you take a strong view on it, but if you want to make the case that you have zero reason whatsoever to conclude that smoking causes lung or to lean in that direction, even one fraction, even one tiny bit, then we just have a difference in epistemic standards. And I, I don't know what to tell you because, again, I just want to be clear, like, yes, there are many limitations to observational data, then there's many limitations to observational data on a country level. Yes, for sure. That doesn't mean that it gives us no reason at all to even move the needle. That's, a, that's the point I want to make here. Let's dig deeper into this, this cigarette hypothetical example. Uh, because it seems that you have the impression that because I would say I have no reason to believe that cigarettes can cause lung cancer, 
that I wouldn't know anything. The thing is, I would know something, but it wouldn't be in that form. What I would I didn't say that, that you wouldn't know anything. Yeah, but, but I just want to point out to the fact that I wouldn't know something. What I would know in that example is that there is something in Sweden that causes them to have more lung cancer. But I still wouldn't know if it's cigarettes or if it's their cheese or if it's the, the way they speak or if it's their blonde hair or the genes that give them their blonde hair. I still wouldn't know any of this. Now, I didn't I ask might start if, having I didn't ask individual... I might dig Wait, that wasn't my individual question. data. So that, that wasn't my question. So my, my question was not if you know it. My question is if you would have any more reason after your priors if you were to have any more reason to con to lean on the side of smoking causing lung cancer rather than if you didn't have that data at all, does it shift but the I needle at mean, all? I wouldn't okay, lean so the answer is no then. Well, no, but I would lean toward something causes lung cancer in Sweden, well, obviously. and it could be, it could be cigarettes. Yeah, it could be, but, but wait, so does, okay, so if you were to estimate your the pro your leaning. So if you ha you have before the data and after the data, you have a certain leaning on whether cigarettes cause cancer. So let's say you're 50 50 to, to, you know, without any data. Now you're presented with this data. Okay. My question is, are you still 50 50 about cigarettes causing lung cancer? I'm still 50 50 at the statement. Yeah, okay. of fact. I am convinced that cigarettes is a possible answer to the problem. But I'm still at 50-50 whether it is an answer to the problem. Okay, so then we just have a we just have a completely different uh, uh, way of evaluating data then, because like I would say Absolutely. even if Absolutely. yeah even because even here's what I would say even if it's terrible even if it's data that's plagued with limitations, um, even if that's the case, my priors would not be exactly 50-50. Even if it's really limited, I can change my leaning to 50.00001 versus you know 49.9999 if it's just incredibly limited data i would not say that it would be reasonable to say okay well yeah we should just cons cons stay at 50 50. um and the stronger and obviously the stronger the data is and the more you know the better controlled it is the more the needle would move for me so if it instead of instead of just the population level uh, observational data, it was a robust prospective cohort data, a bunch of different cohorts, you know, it wouldn't move, you know, 5149, maybe it'll move 60, uh, 60, 40, right? And maybe it'll move 70, 30. But to say that after the data is presented, it's just as uh, your, your, your view on it is just the same as no data at all, because of those limitations. Um, it, it sounds like you're arguing for complete invalidation rather than limitation, which is what you said. And then we just have a completely different epistemic view on this. Um, and yes, we do. And it's fascinating that this, uh, thanks to your honesty and discussion, that this discussion could reach that point. Because I think you touched on the fundamental difference, which is why you are the very good mind to be put on the front line, curing people and making probabilistic decisions. And I'm the guy in the university deciding the state of knowledge on the stuff you will apply. <laughs> no, doctor, I, I think the it's doctor a, of the hospital. I'm the doctor of the lab. No, 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 no. I, I, I think, <laughs> I think that definitely not. I, I definitely would not want, um, I, I want this uh, epistemic standard to be put in a position where um, it would dictate what I would do on the front lines, um, because look again. I, I mean, just again, like it's a different. Look, weak data is not the same thing as no data. That's just the point I want to make here. Like, even if you want, and by the way, I don't even think it's that weak. I think it really is um, a, a very, it's the best, not just the best comparison. I don't see why it would be a bad comparison. I haven't seen any covariates, whether genetic or whether cultural or whether um, pre-existing conditions that would, um, that would be a limitation to this inference. In fact, they actually go the opposite way. They favor they favor Sweden, and you still see Sweden doing worse. But regardless, I think if you have this epistemic standard that observational data on a country level um, of this type just wouldn't move the needle for you at all, then, I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. If, if you don't see it as a reductio, that if Sweden were the only country smoking and the, all the, the, the other uh, Nordic countries didn't get lung cancer and Sweden did get lung cancer or got lung cancer to five times the degree that the other Nordic countries did. If you would say it's just as probable 
it's my priors are 50 50 and after the post and post the evidence it's also 50 50 whether lung whether smoking causes lung cancer i just don't know what to tell you i think that's a reductio on the on the epistemic view that you have um if you and if you don't see that as, as reductio that's fine uh, those listening can decide for themselves if that's a reductio or not this always happens when i engage with the crew of ask yourself <laughs> My extreme positions end up, I'm super comfortable with them, but they end up being so absurd to other minds that they reject it. Look, uh, you look at things in terms of weak evidence and strong evidence. I don't. I look at things, Are is that evidence for the fact or is that evidence for a possibility of the fact? And everything that I see in the Sweden to Nordic country comparison is a comparison of the possibility for the fact. I don't see evidence for the fact. Uh, that's just how I work. And I'm very comfortable with this epistemology. As you pointed out yourself, it's the epistemology being put in place when they test for uh, medication in the FDA approval process. So it's much better that there are people like me at the top of the Ivory Tower and people uh, that are different down in well, the sewer. Well, real quick, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 it's not, just to be real quick, it's not the epistemology of the people being put in place, the FDA Tower, because the question, is, the que you're, you're, you're conflating two different questions now. If your question is whether we should do something or whether we should give FDA approval to a pill or something like that, that's a very different question than is there any leaning other than 50-50? So, so the FDA, by the way, could conclude that a pill that they don't approve is not 50-50. They can say it's 51-49 that it works, and that just doesn't meet the bar to implement the plan. That's fine. They don't have, I don't, you haven't convinced me that the FDA has a different epistemology than I do. It's just that they have a bar to, to implement versus not implement. That's fine. But that's not the question uh, I'm asking. The question uh, I'm asking to you is if are your based on your priors and are is the evidence changing your priors at all? I think the FDA would agree with me that if this type of data was presented for a pill that their that their estimates have differed from their priors, they may just not approve the plan. So those are two different questions you're conflating. Very interesting. But uh, let me give you an information about myself and my public involvement that may help you understand my position here. Uh, to me, stating that something works implies moral consequences. To me, the statement of fact is undistinguishable from its outcome in the world because I'm a public speaker. Because if I say, yes, I feel like it may work, Already that has moral consequences in the world. It has impacts. There will be countries, there will be people influenced by it and potentially recommending to their politicians that they do it. So that's why I'm very FDA-like in my approach of facts. It's that I understand that as an agent in the world, even my statements of facts have moral consequences and political ones. I think that we must understand here that the, it's extremely irresponsible for doctors like you to stand on the public space and to be essentially recommending a pill that hasn't been proven to work. You're applying a different standard, admittedly, to pills than you do to uh, society-wide interventions that will lead to crumbling economies, to potentially other disorders, to potentially discomfort and social problems around the masks and everything. And you are essentially uh, leading our societies to be taking the path of a medical fascistic direction, one in which our politicians are determining whether we wear masks or not, whether we apply this very health-related procedure to ourselves. And that is dangerous to me. Yeah, so I don't know how you're getting any of this. If you know, if the data set is this weak, I don't know how you can make any of those conclusions other than you just speculating. Um, but also the question, I just want to point out that the question of if I say my priors have, you know, that my estimates for my priors have changed are dangerous. It's actually just irrelevant to the debate proposition, um, which is if lockdowns save lives. Um, all I'm saying 
you know, the, the debate proposition isn't whether it's irresponsible for me to say lockdown save lives. It's not, the debate proposition is not whether uh, it'll turn us into a fascist um, country if lockdowns, if I, I say lockdown save lives, that's just all irrelevant, even if the, all, everything you just said is true, which I have no idea how you would get to. Um, because even if all those things are true and we have more reason to believe lockdowns save lives than don't save lives and total mortality, um, then I'm happy with that conclusion with respect to the debate proposition. It's the debate proposition would be more supported toward my side than your side. I am uh, fine with everything I've said today, and I have nothing to add to the debate. I will say you, you guys have just witnessed the difference between PhD, which is at a certain level, and then below there's MD. And uh, <laughs> there are serious reasons why we don't let MDs make conclusions of facts it's because once a fact is stated by someone with credible with scientific credibility we want to be sure of uh, not all perhaps but at least most of it's readily uh, observable political yes, and so medical and I personal have conclusions yeah yeah no I, listen i i have to stop you there because that's a complete hilarious drawman of an idea so no i understand that there's epistemic bars to implemented uh, certain things depending on what they are, depending on what our priors are for the risk. Are your priors for risk could be different for different interventions, so that's one asymmetry. And then I, uh, it, I, I've specified this out. It's very disingenuous for you to make a statement like that. I understand this difference. All I'm saying, the question I specifically asked you, which you don't, which you seem, which you have answered, is not whether it meets a bar or not. It's just whether you have more reason to lean toward it in terms of your doxacity than not to. And you said no to that, that you don't have. And then that's my reductio on your epistemic um, standard. The, the reductio isn't that you wouldn't implement, you wouldn't implement it. Now, if you, if you want to try to say that, that's just the straw man of my position. The reductio is that your, your priors, if your beliefs haven't uh, changed from your priors, that's the reductio. When you are at my level of scientific credibility, Avi, saying it is equivalent to implementing it. I, I don't make the no. difference because my conclusions no, no, of no. knowledge would be repeated across the world as true and as justifying all of these things. It's, uh, it, it's very fine. I, I never got there philosophically. I never quite uh, interrogated myself that deep. But ultimately, that's what it boils down to. I will not make a statement of fact under uncertainty and under a scientific standard that in my view has not been reached, especially if it's in a situation where this thing is being used to justify violations of individual medical rights. Uh, let me ask you maybe as, as a concluding question, do you believe in the right to self-determine medical decisions, including the wearing of masks? I guess it would just depend on the data. It would depend on what if if the data indicates that not wearing a mask is going to just end up killing a whole bunch of other people. Then forget about no. data. Even even in a world where wearing the mask uh, is proven to be efficient, do you think that there is a moral problem here? If it if it's to that degree, if it's to there'll be a threshold where if it's to a certain degree, then I would say no. You have you don't have the right to not wear a mask. All right. Well, you are a very good yeah. medical doctor. I will end with this. Okay. So just what I'll end with is you don't seem to be appreciating the difference between asking if your priors have changed based on a given data versus if the change in your priors meet a certain bar to which you'll implement it or believe that the benefits outweigh the risks. So that's a different i'm asking you the former question not the latter question and then you say well if i say that my prior that my, that my beliefs or leanings have changed from my priors based on the data then that's the same thing as recommending it no it's not um you could i can be totally fine saying that if there was some data that changes my priors about hydroxychloroquine um it's more likely than not to work but it doesn't end up meeting a certain bar i can say that now incidentally i don't believe that's the case for hydroxychloroquine i think the data actually makes it my priors make it less likely to work. But that's a whole different conversation. All I'm trying to show here is that there is a difference in those two types of questions. And the reductio specifically is on your answer to the first question. The reductio is that you have the same 
the Leafs 50-50 after the evidence rather than um, if you didn't have the evidence at all. That seems it's not a question or reductio of whether you're going to agree to make something public policy or not. It's just the nature that you haven't changed your leaning after that type of evidence. And that's just a fundamental flaw in your epistemology. And it's something that PhDs should not have. Um, it's and it's a misunderstanding. Well, yeah. something. And by the way, just to just to degree, just is, since we're on degree flexing, um, I work in clinical trials. I work in the research field. I fully understand FDA approvals. I understand INDs. I understand FDA approvals. I understand the process. Um, so I, I I think you're strawmanning me when you say this about well, it's the same thing as if recommending it as a policy. It really is not. That's not what the reductio is on your view. Well, uh, on the first comment, I will answer that I've already commented. Refusing to update your priors on a set of data that has been demonstrated to be a form of cherry picking is not at all a problem. Uh, I will bring it to the general public here, the audience that's listening to us. Uh, just consider what's needed to adhere to the view that, oh, lockdowns have been working. You need to think that people somehow have not been infected as much through the paths that have been unaddressed by these lockdowns. People going to the grocery store, people going to services that have been labeled as essential somehow, whereas it implicitly affirms that those occupations that people do for a living are not essential, all of them. It's like, do you realize that no one would be doing hair cutting or all of these things that have been stopped by these lockdowns, they wouldn't engage in it if it was not essential to them. Uh, the idea that lockdowns must have worked and that this is what we must see in the bump in Sweden compared to other Nordic countries requires you to ignore the fact that in all these countries where there are lockdowns, UK, United States, Democrat States, Canada, Italy, all of these places, and I'm not even talking about South America, where in fact there has been severe lockdowns and that have not led to much results and that have led to epidemics that are even bigger than the one in Sweden. You have to believe that somehow the truth lies in a little region of the planet contained between Sweden, Norway, and a handful of other countries. I say, look around, look around you will see that the virus has spread. It has spread in countries that are fully locked down to the best standards that we know of. Even these standards were not enough to stop the virus. The virus will spread. It will affect everyone it has to affect. As for Avi's comment on being part of the FDA approval and research process, okay, uh, too bad. I think that this process is in fact headed toward its own perdition. Uh, it has abandoned its own standards. And especially when it comes down to vaccines and obligatory masks, unfortunately, our modern society is headed toward abandoning this process under the kind of illusion that because it's not a pill, it's okay. Well, to me, because the, the discussion we're having here on Discord is not a pill, it doesn't change my standard. The standard is you will be violating someone's boundary. You will be applying a medical procedure onto them by force of political power, intimidation, and poss possibly jail time if they don't do it. It is absolutely insane that young doctors coming out of university like Avi are currently forgetting that their dedication was to consensual medical interventions, not the form of social engineers that the communists want us to implement everywhere on this planet, which has demonstrated again and again that it doesn't work. It doesn't stop viruses. It doesn't stop poverty. It has never worked on anything it has set to undertake. Yes, yeah, so all of this was just, um, all that last part was just irrelevant to the debate proposition. Um, debate proposition wasn't whether you're going to violate rights or whether we weren't going to work or we're not going to become communists or whether we um, are whether my what I agreed to in terms of my um, coming out of university and medicine. Debate proposition was whether lockdowns incre uh, increase or decrease um, 
the lives lost. And my case is that it should change your priors to lean in the direction of saving lives. Now, as far as the other objections JF brought in the beginning, I've already dealt with them. And he wants to call them cherry picking. It's actually just cherry picking to look the other way and to point out UK, let alone the fact that, let's ignore the fact that the UK locked down late and compared, compared to other neighboring regions, if you adjust for the first days of infection. It's cherry picking to point out countries that have so many more covariates to Sweden than the countries that are closer to it. And no, I don't say that they're the only countries that need to be put into the data set. You can put other countries into the data set, but then you need to have a way of making adjustments in your models for the covariates. That's all. And I'm okay with that. Now, JF doesn't have that. I don't have it either. Is the evidence have very, very similar countries with different populations. There can always be residual confounding. That's a limitation in every observational study. Residual confounding is nothing new. It's a limitation, not an invalidation, in all sorts of observational data. And we don't reject the data to change our priors. I don't see why we should do it here. So, All right, yeah, I mean, ask yourself. I think we are done here. We have done our concluding statements, unless Avi had anything else to add. No, thanks for coming on, Jeff. Thanks, it was great. Bye-bye, everyone, and thanks for listening. Alrighty, have a good day, guys.